Good afternoon again. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. It's good to see all of you and, and welcome to all of our visitors to uh, Columbus. Uh, I'm Mo Wright, uh, president of Raymond Consultant, and for about another 41 days, I'll be chair of the board of trustees for CMC. To get today's program underway, the Columbus Metropolitan Club is pleased to present Rich and Poor, Urban or Rural, Counties Matter. Today's forum is sponsored by Morpsey and the Dispatch Media Group, represented here today by so many of their associates. Let's give them a round of applause for their support. <laughs> and now here to introduce our speakers is Matt Greeson, Chairman of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Matt. Thank you, Mo. The Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, MORPSI, is proud to support the Columbus Metropolitan Club and its mission to connect people and ideas and to engage the community in conversation on important topics. So nowadays, I'm the city manager of the great city of Worthington, Ohio, just to the north here, and the current board chair of MORPSI. But over 20 years ago, it was a county that gave me my first opportunity to serve in local government and I will forever be grateful for that. Therefore, I find it particularly special to welcome the first few of what is gonna be thousands of visitors to our city and our region who are here for the 82nd Annual Conference and Exhibition of the National Association of Counties, NACO. We welcome you to Columbus and Central Ohio and we applaud the important work you do. Across this nation, County governments touch our lives really every day. They are at the forefront of many of the issues of our time, ranging from running effective elections to preparing for our worst disasters, facing our opioid epidemic, to managing social service and criminal justice reform. To explore why counties matter and play such an important role in our country's communities let us turn to our expert panel today. Please welcome Executive Director of NACO, the National Association of Counties, Matt Chase. Visiting from Grant County, Oklahoma, Commissioner Cindy Bobbitt. Our own Franklin County Commissioner, John O'Grady. And our host today, journalist at the Columbus Dispatch, Barb Carmen. Barb. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. Let's just get rolling with some questions. I have a lot of questions, and I'm sure the audience will as well. Um, I would like to ask each of the two commissioners, Commissioner Bobbitt, Commissioner O'Grady, and then Matt, if you can answer this as well. What are the greatest challenges that your particular county faces today, and what are you doing to meet them? And then, Director Chase, if you can ask, answer that in a more general fashion as to what the greatest challenges you see nationally and what the NACO is doing to help counties. Can we start with Commissioner O'Grady? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you know, Barb, I think you and I have talked about this question um, a multitude of times. Um, probably the, the, the biggest thing, and well, first let me start with, uh, I want to introduce um, my colleagues that are here. Marilyn Brown is there in the middle of the room. Kevin Boyce is over there on the right. Um, we have a couple of tables of county staff here as well uh, that, that, are, that make, the, make us look good, I always say. Uh, we have some CCAO staff here, Suzanne Delaney and Cheryl Subler and Kate Neidhammer. Uh, my wife Pam is here at the front table. Former county executive Don Brown and Ken Wilson are over there. Ken's the current county administrator, I'm sorry. So we have some good people here. County funding with, with Don and Ken sitting there next to each other. For all of these, uh, a multitude of prog uh, projects that we have coming up, uh, everybody comes to uh, county government with uh, their handout on a daily basis. Um, I have a big conference table in my office and, and uh, uh, Lauren, my, my policy director, is sitting in yellow there in the middle of the room, you can't miss her. Uh, Lauren knows better than anybody that nobody comes to my office just to come to my office. They all come wanting something. Every once in a while somebody's smart enough to come in just to say hi. And, and uh, Brian Ross from Experience Columbus is really good at this, and there's uh, Mike Brown sitting next to him. They come in and they just say hi. But it's always to lay the groundwork for the next time they come in <laughs> when they're coming in with a multi-million dollar ask. 
Well, and it worked. We, we ended up coming here for the national meeting. So yeah, it worked. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but they're always coming in. They always have their hand out. They always they need something. They they and so there's a lot of conversations that happen around my table, around Kevin's table, around Maryland's table, where everybody has that ask. Well, right now this community is faced with a multitude of major projects, major funding issues that are on our on, in front of us right now. We're getting ready. I was talking to Matt. Um, Matt uh, uh, Habash, before we started, we're, we're getting ready to have a conversation as a community around in the area around around poverty, um, because because we have an affordable housing uh, uh, issue in front of us. We have uh, we have arts funding. You know, um, uh, Cindy was asking before we started. My wife and I, have, we, you know, since Pam works for the mayor and city government, we must have all kinds of public policy conversations. We actually don't. We talk about the kids all the time, but. <laughs> But when we do, it's it's always you know, around public. When we have conversations around public policy, Pam sits on the GCAC board, so a lot of times it goes to arts funding. Well, we have a huge arts funding problem in this community. We have so we have affordable housing problem. We have arts funding problem. We have, I mean, I can go on and on, uh, and I'm I'm blanking on what they all are. But you know, we have uh, we have social. We have um, I mean, I see Michael Daniels in the room. We have uh, so we have uh, justice issues that we have. Uh, I mean, there's a, a, a huge number. Of, of of funding requests and and they never stop and so um, you know we have and, and, the, and the most of them are around social services and poverty and and so that's to me is is the single biggest challenge that we have in this community is how do we address all of those funding requests where there's a never-ending stream of, of, of requests and and so that's that to me is the biggest issue that we deal with great Commissioner Bobbitt well, Commissioner O'Grady, you're a large county. Let's see, you have 1.3 million people in your county. I don't know how, and then there's 2 million people in your metroplex here. I'm from a rural county. Uh, we have 1,800 square miles, 4,500 people. But guess what our number one problem is? Funding. So it doesn't matter if you're a large county or a small county, we share so many common goals. So transportation, obviously, since we have 1,800 square miles, is, is a big issue. In the state of Oklahoma, 4,500 people, I have the most bridges and the fifth highest number of road miles in the entire state. But my funding is 63rd out of 77 counties. So funding is also an issue on bridges and roads and you know it's all that but we also have to balance our budgets so we take care of the sheriff's department the health department um we're the local dog catcher you know we do it all you know we have dead animals and who do they call they call their county commissioner so anything that comes up so we are very alike in that so it is funding for very rural counties as well and we have to work with our state federal and local partners it's uh, very important as a member of a county to be a member of this national association because they can help us so much on the federal issues. Unfunded mandates are a real problem for us, or underfunding. Thank you. Well, that leads us to <laughs> Director Chase. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to the Metropolitan Club, and thank you to our hosts, Franklin County and the Ohio State Association of County Commissioners for bringing us here. It's just a great community, and I actually come to Columbus quite a bit because Nationwide Retirement manages deferred compensation for over 1.6 million county employees across the country. So Nationwide actually manages about $16 billion in supplemental retirement money for county employees across the country. So in addition to the great partnership with Commissioner O'Grady and, and all the Franklin County folks, we have a, a lot of uh, relationships here. So our biggest issues, I would say, are the lack of focus on problem solving particularly between federal, state, and local officials. At the county level, we're seeing great collaboration between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors across the country. But let me just give you a little bit of the scale of county governments across the country. So if you took all of our 3,069 units of government counties across the country, our combined budgets are about $560 billion. $560 billion. We have 3.6 million employees across the country, which is over 1% of Americans actually work for county government. So all those things that you think the city does, it's actually the county. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, Matt. But the, the former president of the National League of Cities, Mayor Chris Coleman, out of 
St. Paul, Minnesota used to joke to me. He said, I will never, ever miss a NACO meeting. You invite me, I will be there because you do the work and I take the credit. <laughs> so, and, and why do we have that many employees? Well, that $560 billion is rooted in, in local infrastructure and in human infrastructure as well as physical infrastructure. And I'll go quick. But the health care discussion is huge to county governments. We spend over $100 billion a year on health care for the indigent and low income across the country. Counties own 1,000 hospitals across the country, 60% of them in rural. There's big as Cook County Hospital, if you remember the TV show ER, down to the rural areas. We have about 600 nursing homes and long-term care facilities. You remember the term, the county poorhouse? Those were the original nursing homes that counties took care of the indigent within our communities, primarily funded through Medicaid and then local tax dollars. We also are public health arms across the country. So the Center for Disease Control relies on county and multi-county public health, and then behavioral health with substance abuse and mental health. On infrastructure, we own 45% of the roads in this country. So if you go to a state like Kansas or Iowa, counties will own 90 plus percent of the roads in that state. We own 40% of all the bridges, so four out of 10 bridges, 236,000 bridges, as well as a third of the airports and a third of transit. So if you're flying to Las Vegas or Miami, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, those are all county owned airports, as well as a lot of general purpose airports across the country. So when we talk about problem solving, we're really focused on the core building blocks that the, uh, our citizens need and the private sector needs for commerce. And then I would just want to applaud the Metropolitan Club for your last week's meeting on civility. We work with Carolyn Lukensmeyer and Tom Daschle and many others. That's a great forum on civility. Our current president is from Leon County, which is Tallahassee, Florida. He could be here and talk football with you all day. But he actually funds out of his own personal pocket the Village Square program, which is very similar to what you were talking about last week around conversations on civility because we really have serious issues in this country that we need to deal with. And the last thing I'll just say, and these two are great representatives, 50% of the American public lives in 144 counties. The other 50% lives in 2,900 counties. But they have the exact same federal and state mandates. So our largest county is Los Angeles County with 10 million people, larger than the state of Ohio, now the same size as the state of Georgia or the state of North Carolina, 110,000 employees, a $30 billion budget. They have the same exact mandates as Commissioner Bobbitt in Grant County. Same EPA requirements, same health and human service requirements, same exact criminal justice requirements. It does not matter the scale. They have to deliver the exact same services. Thank you. You mentioned, Director Chase, uh, that counties run hospitals and obviously the big topic in Ohio is the opioid crisis and mental health treatment and mental health issues. Can each of you address for the audience how changes in federal funding and the pending, the ongoing health care debate and the Obamacare replacement and changes in Medicaid funding is affecting you personally in your county? I'd like to start. Well, if I could just set the yeah. stage and then go in Franklin counties with. Commissioner Brown has been a leader in our mental health and jails conversation, but the health care conversation in D.C. is not about health care. There is zero conversation about health care. And I just wrote an op-ed about it, so I'm okay, and our public affairs director's there. I'm okay. He's okay with me saying it. This is all about a cost shift. It is a, and, and if you listen to the Senate Republicans, they will tell you it is a $2 trillion tax cut offset with $800 billion in Medicaid funding. It has nothing to do with health care. From a county perspective, we know from those states that have already cut health care, the first thing is we got to get private employers to provide health care. The country peaked with 77% of Americans used to get their health care through their employer. Today it's 49%. So why do we have a health care problem? Employers can no longer afford or choose not to afford to provide health care. So now it becomes a public responsibility. Somebody will always pay. The opioid crisis, Suzanne Delaney, who's my counterpart in the state, called me two weeks ago and said, we have counties in the state of Ohio who the coroners are out of room in the morgue to store the bodies. 
and so Medicaid is the number one funder in this country for substance abuse and mental health, and they want to cut $800 billion in Medicaid funding and, and replace it with $45 billion directed to opioid. From a county perspective, we know that if you don't have long-term care, and I don't mean nursing home care, but sustained health care, you will use the ER, the homeless shelter, or the jail as your primary care provider. Great. Commissioner Bobbitt. Uh, jails, that's where our health care is, I suppose, because in our jail, we have a we have a 30-bed jail, and it's county-owned. However, only about five of them probably are from Grant County. The rest of our inmates we, we take in from other counties. But 75% of the people that are in this jail are there because of of drug abuse. They have mental problems. So the health care that we're providing is in through our jails, and that is not an appropriate place for them to be. And so we're, we're looking at that, trying to find other programs, but again, with a budget of our size, it's really difficult to find other programs, and the jail is not the appropriate place, but that's where we find that we deal mostly with our health care issues. If I, and if I could just frame it before Commissioner Grady jumps in. You as county taxpayers, if you own a home and you're paying property tax, you are funding this. If, if with the opiate crisis, which tends to be needle-driven with heroin, if you have hepatitis C, and you are in a county jail or a state prison, you are probably costing that jail $100,000 a year for your hepatitis C medication. If you happen to be incarcerated and you need a liver transplant, you are probably costing that jail about $600,000, which means you as property tax hunters. So our whole focus is how do we actually help these folks recover? And more importantly, how do we take a multi-generational approach and it's great to hear Franklin County talk about poverty because we're launching an initiative at this conference on early childhood development. Again, in Ohio, the counties are seeing skyrocketing foster care. The foster care roles are up three, four hundred percent. So it's not only impacting the user who is now out of the workforce, but typically there's kids present. And so this is a multi-generational tragedy. And the last thing I'll say, I was telling Barb, I recently sat at a, a small event with James Clapper, who is this country's national defense head, um, oversaw national defense. And he talked about not the Russia stuff and everything else, but he went through the, the global threats in Iran and North Korea and Russia. And he said, that's what the official government threat assessment is. But I will tell you, and he's worked for every president since JFK, that the number one threat to this country is the drug crisis because the supply is coming from Chinese chemists and cartels through the Mexican cartels. These are foreign, sovereign, organized threats that we are providing the demand and they are providing the supply. And he is very clear that it's a strategy to erode this country from the inside out. You don't have to fire a gun or shoot a missile. You can eat it away. And so we're very serious about the need to be competitive in the global workforce, and we think counties play a key role in providing kind of the, the leadership and the infrastructure locally so that the private businesses and citizens can thrive. Great. Um, Commissioner Grady, can you pick up on that and talk about what Franklin County has done to address its opioid crisis? I know you've been a leader in that, and also the burden that this has placed on children's services, which also fall under the commissioners. Sure. So... Um, so we, seeing that, you know, the, obviously we, we recognize the problem here. We got with uh, the mayor and the city council president along with, well, actually Dr. Long, Teresa Long was the one who originally uh, brought the issue to me um, from Columbus Public Health. And Dr. Long and I sat and talked and, and we, we worked on a framework for how we needed to have a community action plan for this and how we needed to address uh, um, you know, bring all of the players around the table and figure out how this uh, we could we could best address this. And David Royer from uh, from our Adam uh, board, uh, the director of our Adam board, is the guy who uh, is has been leading the effort, uh, along with um, uh, f uh, the backing and the help of, of the city and the county. Uh, Council President uh, Klein is in the room, I believe, is he not? Yeah, he's in the back of the room there. I should recognize, by the way, our friends from Delaware and Union County are at the front table as well. 
Uh, good to see you guys. Um, but Council President uh, Klein is, is taking a lead role in this as well. Um, and, and so we brought everybody to the table, uh, the city and the county, we brought, all, we brought law enforcement, we brought, uh, um, we brought our folks from the, the Division of Fire together, uh, our, our, uh, our coroner, um, we brought uh, the folks from the Sheriff's Department, we brought everybody to the table to discuss this, and David Royer has taken a lead role. And frankly, when we, be, when we, when we started down this road, you know, in terms of uh, federal and state plan uh, or, or their involvement, um, you know, we can't, we, we've just decided we, we can't rely uh, on, on, on help from the federal and state government. Um, we hope that we're going to have help from the federal and state government. We're pursuing help from the federal and state government, but we also know that we can't, we can't count on it. Um, and so while we're going to continue to push and we're going to continue to pursue those, those avenues and those angles uh, to try to, to see what we can get. Uh, and, and be as aggressive as we can to try to get help from the federal and state government. Uh, we're going to do all we can to, to put in place uh, the, the, the resources, all the resources that we can here from a local perspective. Uh, but David put together the plan. We asked him for a community response. He put together the structure, the governance structure, and we put together the plan. Uh, it's been fantastic. We just, we, there's just an article uh, in the paper, the dispatch wrote the article the other day about um, the uh, the new uh, facility that we're going to fund at uh, the out or out at um, Mary Haven uh, for some new beds and so um, but it's it's a community wide approach with everybody uh, that's involved at the table uh, trying to do all that we can to make sure that uh, we're stacking hands uh, here in this community. Can you mention children's services? What what is this burden you're seeing with that, and how do you fund that? I'm sorry, say that again. Can you mention children's services? The burden that's been placed on that, and how do you fund that? And well, I'm you know, um, there's obviously you know children's services is going to end up seeing the you know a, a huge um, impact from uh, because you know there's there, the agencies you know already. Uh, dealing with um, you know the uh, the impact of it and you know, how we fund it um, the the state uh, has um, you know the dollars that we get from the state have been um, you know I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, <laughs> I never know you'd be politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's uh, it, it's 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 difficult. I'm not sure you know at this point um, I'm looking at uh, our friends from I'm I'm looking at my co my colleagues and I'm also looking at our friends from CCAO and I'm trying to be um, I'm not certain how uh, how we're going to be able to you know how we're going to do that and I'm not certain how we're, what the answer is going to be. Uh, Kate Knight, Knighthammer from CCAO is probably the best person to answer the question. Uh, this is kind of in her bailiwick, but I, I, I'm I'm a little worried about how to you know I, I don't know where those dollars are going to come from. Yeah, I just want to add some things on the opioid real quick. Last year we had a task force of the National League of Cities and the counties, and we had 16 leaders from across the country. At the same time, the national governors were having a task force, and we worked together. And some of the things that came out of it were from law enforcement. The number one message was we can't arrest our way out of this problem. We have a cultural problem, and we had counties look at their TV advertisements. Over 50% in the typical market of TV advertisements are big pharma. And then we wonder why folks think it's okay to take as many pills as you want. Second is federal policy was changed several years ago for Medicare and Medicaid to really push doctors to alleviate all their patients' pain. So it was federal policy that pushed people because the doctors and my brother's a physician, we were talking, Matt's got family members are physicians, their rankings were being scored on, did you alleviate your patient's pain? And then we wonder why doctors overprescribe, same with dentists. So it's a, it starts with a cultural problem. We're not gonna arrest our way out of it. The folks, if you ever go to like a methadone clinic or somewhere where people are recovering from prescription drug or heroin, they tell you the, the withdrawal is the problem. It's not that they don't want to recover, it's that the withdrawal is a thousand times worse than the flu. And so they'll tell you they're not taking these drugs for the high, they're, they're doing it for what they call the well, because they can't stand the withdrawal. It's so incredibly difficult. 
But it comes back to what NACO is focused on this week, and the overarching thing is economic opportunity. We have to provide new economic opportunity and give folks hope, or we will continue to have societal problems. I mean, we always will have poverty, but we want to figure out how can the Grant counties in Oklahoma with 4,500 people contribute to the global economy. I would argue actually they do. They're producing wheat and other commodities that go across the globe. But a lot of it started in the areas that were economically distressed, but now it's everywhere. I'll jump in there really Please quick. Uh, Grant County, yeah, we have $98.6 billion in GD, uh, gross production that we provide. But back on the drugs, so I'm sitting on a board now for our drug courts. We're, we're trying to get these people out of jail, you know, just to arrest them because maybe they went out and broke into a home and stole some electronics so they could go buy their drugs. It isn't always that they get arrested because they're on the drugs, but it's because of some of the actions so that they can get their drugs. So anyway, one way or another, they're getting into our jail. So we've got this uh, pr a drug court now that we're trying to get these people into a recovery program. But right now, because it's so new and we are so small and so limited, we have a focus on a very small minority. It's the, the young kids. But our drug problem, let's face it, is not just our young people. This is our, our, our people that are, are our age, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, and it is because of the prescriptions drugs. So that is one step that we are taking. I know Miami-Dane uh, County in Florida has done a, a tremendous job in this area where uh, Sally Heyman, one of our county commissioners, has an outstanding program where they've, uh, and, and Matt, you jump in because you know the figures on that. Uh, how many they had in their jail and the number that they have uh, brought down because of the help they've provided. Great. And let me switch topics for a quick second and ask you another on another subject. Counties are responsible for managing elections from the township clerk to that of the president of the United States. Given that elections today are fought as vigorously in the courtroom as they are in the community, have your costs of administration increased and how are you keeping up with technology needs and security mandates. We also are concerned that maybe we have some foreign tampering going on. So if you can talk a little bit about what counties are doing to keep up with technology and keep voting secure. Uh, Do we have to? <laughs> Very quickly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, um, elections cost more uh, every cycle. Um, you know, we, we budget for them. And, and, and understand, it's, you know, uh, this year, 2017, the the, uh, uh, the cycle is less expensive than a presidential year in 2016. 2018 will be less expensive than the presidential year. You know, so each each cycle is a different cost, but but when you compare them, you know, apples to apples, you know, they go up each time. And um, you know, we're not getting we're not getting a lot of help. We just found out uh, through CCO. We just found out that we're not getting much uh, help in uh, this uh, from the state government in this budget for. Um, uh, voting machines uh, replacement. Our machines are getting old. Uh, they need to be replaced. We're not getting any help uh, from state government for the replacement of those those machines. Um, uh, we do have concerns over over election tampering. Um, we have to figure out how to continue to make things more secure as we as we head forward. Um, you know there there are. Uh, not um, there's no one universal system. There probably shouldn't be one universal system. Um, it's uh, you know when you, when the when you know the the um, there, there's a good reason why uh, when the president requested uh, everybody's information to be put into one repository in the White House, uh, all this, most of the Secretary of States from around the, the country said no. Uh, that was a smart move by those Secretary of States, and I applaud uh, Secretary Husted for telling the president no. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're expensive. They're going to continue to become more expensive, uh, and funding for them, uh, you know, it is a, you know, it's a mandate from the state of Ohio. Uh, it's a mandate, you know, and, and, and so we're going to need some, some help going forward. Uh, the legislature is not, uh, generally too, this legislature has not been generally too, uh, willing to, uh, help us to the level that we need. Uh, and so we're going to need to figure out how to work with them to uh, make them understand that we need some help. Great. Commissioner Bobbitt? Uh, yes. Uh, one county. If you've seen one county, you've seen one county. Um, 
we're not alike. So, but in Oklahoma, our laws are all kind of laid out pretty, pretty plain. Um, our state does help us with our machines um, and does keep us up to date. We're pretty fortunate in that. But as always, um, so it doesn't. One size does not fit all. You're correct in that. So I think each state needs to find out what works for them. And I do agree that I'm glad that our election boards did not release that information. It is uh, private, but I think that working together we can find some solutions and some common goals out there to move forward. Just, just real quickly on, on the elections, because it is a decentralized system, it's basically state controlled, county run in most states, it's very hard to tamper. So a lot of the Russia stuff was actually more aimed at changing votes, not the machines. And I can't think of one county machine that's plugged into a network. So they're standalone machines. Uh, our biggest concern in elections right now is the federal government's not going to help. In fact, they're making it worse. The Congress passed a bill in the House to eliminate the U.S. Election Commission, which was put in place after the Bush Gore to actually have standardized certification of machines. They're actually proposing to eliminate it. So we have great concern because they want to move it to the Federal Elections Commission, which is a partisan body, three Republicans, three Democrats, and if, they're not, if they don't have the right number of commissioners, they can't function, literally. And so abolishing the U.S. Election Commission is a severe problem where we will lose the ability to have some common standards. And it's still state controlled, but rather than have a race to the bottom, it should be a race to the top with the best ability for our citizens to participate. But there's a lot going on in the election world, and people should pay attention. Thank you. In a few minutes, we're going to move to the audience questions, but I'd like to ask you this one final thought. If each of you could wave a magic wand and money was not an issue, what service would you like to start up to provide in your county? <laughs> I floored you. Go for it. We know it's you. Bridges. I know. Bridges. I was going to say, <laughs> want to be bridges. Uh, Oklahoma is, uh, uh, between Oklahoma and Pennsylvania, we're known for the worst uh, bridges in, in the nation, so I would uh, fix every bridge I have. But tell me how many bridges you have. <laughs> well, okay, uh, on the National Bridge Inventory, that's MBI, the bridge has to be 20 feet or longer to be on there. Uh, last year on our NBI, uh, we have around 600. Now, 20 years ago, we had 1,000. Now you say, now how did you get rid of 400 bridges, Cindy? Well, we didn't, but we had to take them off the bridge inventory system because they had been closed so long or we had put temporary structures in there that we had to take them off. But in addition to those that are on the national bridge inventory, I have bridges that are 20 feet and under, and I have about another 3,000 of those. So in a county of 4,500, we have about 3,500 structures that we have to maintain of just the bridges, not counting the 1,800 actual miles. So see me after the meeting for Adopt a Bridge Program, <laughs> and, and you can have your own bridge. I would love to have you own a bridge you know, naming right. <laughs> And, and, you know, at OSU, maybe not the OSU, but you can come and have one. So, so. Commissioner Grady, where would you put those dollars if you could have anything? Well, if money's not an option, I got a lot of things. But, no, uh, you know, you know she's got, you got 1,800 square miles. We have 544 square miles, and we only have 500 bridges in Franklin County. So, um, you got bridges, man. You got bridges. Um, if, if, if money was – there's – there's a laundry list of things that we have funding issues for in Franklin County, but if money wasn't an option, you said I can only do one thing, Barth? Just one? Just one. If money's not an option, why only one? <laughs> um, if money's not an option, I think at the, at the, probably at the top of the list, our biggest, probably our biggest funding problem in Franklin County right now is, is, is affordable housing. Um, we, you know, I, I said we have a, this, this big community conversation on poverty that's coming and, and you know, if Director Bivens was here from our Job and Family Services Department, she could probably give you a laundry list of things that uh, she'd like like me to answer. But um, I think the, the single most difficult um, thing that we have to figure out how to address 
is going to be, you know, because we have a bunch of things, but, but Ken and I sit in my office and say, okay, well, we can probably figure out how to pay for this one. We can probably figure out how to pay for this one. The one, I, the one I'm trying to, that, I, that I'm really trying to figure out how to pay for is we have a, a shortage of 32,000 affordable units in Franklin County that impacts 54,000 people. Um, if you, you know, by most folks guesstimate, that's about $10,000 a unit. That's about a half a billion dollar, um, or about, I'm sorry, it's about 300 and some million dollar problem. That's not a problem that we, I don't, we don't have 300 some million dollars sitting around that Franklin County can throw at the problem. If we did, the more of you would be in my office asking for money. <laughs> um, so it's a problem that we have to figure out how to address, but it's also a problem that the city of Columbus has to figure out how to address. It's also a problem that we need help from the state and federal government to figure out how to address. And you've heard us talk about how that's been going lately. Great. So it's, it's a problem, and um, we don't have an easy answer for it yet. Um, we've had folks in our office, you know, every, everybody's immediate answer to all of the problems is, well, let's just have a levy. You know, well, we have a levy system in Franklin County, and it works really well. And if we throw another levy on the ballot, just for any old reason, then you, you put all the other levies in jeopardy, and we don't want to do that. And so we need to we need to figure out how to solve this problem. We really do. And and uh, so that's the one that at the moment um, I'm a little stumped by, uh, and and we need to bring some some uh, smarter folks than me around the table to figure out how to do that, and we're doing that. We are discussing it, uh, and we're trying to figure out how to address the issue, but, but affordable housing is, is, the, is the thing that we need to address right now. Thank you. I would just say from our perspective, putting civic ed education back into the classroom. So um, we've launched a partnership several years ago with former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who is spending all of her retirement focused on civic education and we have a game online that actually teachers and a school curriculum, whether it's learning about cities, county, state government, but putting civic education back into the classroom. Thank you. It is the Columbus Metropolitan Club's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name, ask your question. We thank you in advance for not making long editorial remarks. No homilies, please. And if you'd like to make your way up to the microphone, we'll take our first questions. Hello, uh, Andy Campbell, happy to do the honors with the first question. I wonder if you could each share some examples maybe in addressing some of the problems we talked about of how policy um, could help with that. So for instance, in the arts sector, maybe uh, required uh, set-asides for developers to contribute to public arts or policy in regards to um, uh, affordable housing, uh, same, same idea. So best, best examples of how policy can affect some of the problems. Well, I'll let these guys think. Um, the big issue that we have federally is we're getting ready for federal tax reform. And so you've got Congressman T. Berry in this area who's on the House Ways and Means Committee. We really need attention to we need tax reform beyond just corporate America. Corporate America certainly needs attention. But unfortunately, the number one pay for are going to be local residents. So the way they're paying for corporate tax reform is to abolish what's called the state and local tax deduction. So when you file your federal taxes and you deduct your state income tax and your local property tax, they want to take that away and use the $1.3 trillion in new federal revenue over the 10 years to pay for corporate tax reform. So the problems that the county and the city have will only be exacerbated because our local property tax owners will be $1.3 trillion poorer. And in a state like Ohio, it's a big deal, particularly in the Columbus metropolitan area where Congressman T. Berry's district, 35% of the folks use this tax deduction. And that is tied also to the mortgage interest tax deduction. So how we use the tax code, I think, to help not only be economically competitive, which we certainly agree with, but not do it on the backs of actually the workers and the local property tax owners. That we need to focus on some win-wins. And right now, policy in DC is not about win-win. 
it's there's a winner and there's a loser and there's not a lot of conversation about how, how do we create win-win situations for all involved I'll jump in there on that also another uh, a, important example is our municipal bonds they're also talking about taking our tax exempt municipal bonds out of and making them taxable in Oklahoma that is the way we build schools, that's the way we build hospitals, that's the way we build roads and bridges, and that we, it does it so that we can afford it. If you take that out, there is no private-public partnership. Nobody's going to come to Grant County and a private company and come and help me build a road and a bridge, but we can bond them and use those tax-exempt bonds. So it, we have to have those to move our projects forward. Another issue on the federal deal is Waters of the U.S., uh, WOTUS. Um, uh, that is huge for uh, Oklahoma or, and Ohio as well. Um, if I want to go clean out my ditch under the new regulations that they were trying to propose under the waters of the U.S., I'd have had to get a 404 permit, which meant was I couldn't go clean out my roads and ditches until I got approval from the federal government. And as we know, the federal government doesn't move quickly. So it, it, it dams up your waterways and it causes a lot of issues. So those are just some of the issues out there that we need to continue to have our partnerships with. Well, we'll all jump on the NACO bandwagon here. Um, the the tax exempt municipal bond issue is uh, crucial. We we've all uh, been in D.C. lobbying on that issue. Um, you know, we local governments need tax exempt municipal bonds to be able to to be able to operate and to be able to fund projects. But but Andy, on a local issue here, um, we've been trying to figure out uh, arts funding in this community for a while now. Um, uh, you know, a few years back, they had the um, what they call that the FRAC funding review arts. You know, the, the local FRAC the, to try to figure out arts arts funding. Um, Franklin County has been looking at how do we uh, involve ourselves in arts funding for some time. Um, and and as a member of um, my wife's on the GCAC uh, board or was on the GCAC board until last month. I'm uh, I'm on the the NACO Arts and Culture Commission. And so I, when I go to NACO meetings, uh, I ask folks, you know, in your community, how do you guys fund local art? When I go to a community and I see um, public art around the community, how do you guys fund that? What do you guys do to fund local art? Um, and so we've, it, it's been something that, that I've, we've been looking at and trying to figure out for some time. Uh, the Con Convention Facilities Authority has just done a huge amount of, of, of local public art in the new convention center that, by the way, is beautiful and opened and, and done. The project's complete. Very proud of you guys for getting that done. Don Brown and uh, Sally Bloomfield that are here. Um, uh, and so it's been, it's been an, uh, an, an issue of interest uh, to try to figure that out. One of the conversations that's been on the table since the frack, one of the things that, that they do in communities all over the country and that we've had some conversation here privately about is, you know, what about this idea of, of um, doing a, a surcharge on, on some of the events? Uh, I forget, you know, I don't know what the, the, the phrase is that, that's currently being bandied about, but, you know, putting a, an additional charge on, uh, some, you know, when you go to whether it's a ball game or you go to the symphony or you go to... Uh, you go to an event, putting an additional charge on some of those, uh, some of those events to be able to pay for uh, th different things, some of which could be uh, uh, used for, for funding local art. Uh, and so that, and that's something that's done in, in communities around the country. And so, uh, you know, those are, that's, the, you know, a possible uh, avenue for public policy change here in central Ohio. Uh, there are those in this community that are very much for that. Uh, there are those that, that question it. So we'll have to see going forward if that's a possibility. Great. Can we have our next question? Sure. Tim Sword, <clears throat> excuse me, president of Greater Columbus Sister Cities International. Uh, we have 10 international sister cities, and we're called Greater Columbus because Franklin County is an equal partner with the city of Columbus for our funding. Um, we connect with our 10 international cities, and I have to commend all these commissioners because they haven't even mentioned what they do with me or economic development because they're talking, you know, you're talking about all these other things. But there's a lot of leadership in economic development that you haven't mentioned, whether it's your investment and partnership in Columbus 2020 or Sister Cities and others. Wondered if you would talk about that, Commissioner O'Grady. And Matt, kind of curious around the nation, if you're familiar with other countries or counties that fund international programming or initiatives. 
I'd love to talk about it. Tim, thanks for asking. Barb didn't ask us any questions about that, so I didn't have a chance to sneak any of that in. Um, so yeah, we are very excited about, and, and our economic development director, Jim Schimmer, is in the room, and, and we partner with the city of Columbus and, and, and others around the region. Um, I, I got a text message from Kenny McDonald, our, our director of Columbus 2020, uh, while I was sitting up here. And with Tim and, and with uh, 2020, with Sister Cities and with 2020, we are actually in conversations about uh, the possibility of, a, of, a, of an international trip here later this fall. Uh, to to Spain and, and Italy and potentially Ireland uh, uh, in the fall. We did an international trip with sister cities in, in um, 2020 to India a number of years back. Commissioner Brown has has done international uh, uh, trips to to Israel and to, to Brazil, um, and so we've 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 been very active uh, with international travel. I'm on the uh, NACO uh, international. Um, uh, International Economic Development Committee, um, Franklin County, we see ourselves as an international uh, player. And, and I know the city of Columbus is very active in international business as well. Um, this community can't survive uh, simply uh, looking at, uh, our, at, this, at this region alone. We have to uh, be very active uh, around the country and around, uh, around the world. Um, we are we are seen uh, internationally uh, and globally uh, as as a player. Uh, we knew that we saw that when we traveled to India. Um, we have uh, many things to offer uh, to our partners and to and to potential business partners around the world. Uh, our our global logistics hub here at Rickenbacker is is very much a jewel and. Uh, it is something that, that I promoted uh, when we went to India, and we continue to promote. Uh, and so there are many, many things that you know that we see, and we're going to show that off here to our friends from NACO on Friday. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, a bus trip, a tour going down there. Uh, an L Brands plane is coming in. We're going to you know you guys are all going to glaze over when I tell you about it, but county commissioners are going to love it. Uh, they're going to bring a plane in. We're going to unload it. We're going to right in front of their eyes. It's going to be fantastic. So, so that is say, it. Say, real quick, we have the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture come to this conference to talk really about ag exports, which outside of aircraft is really the country's second largest export opportunity. Commissioner O'Grady mentioned we have an international economic development task force. We often hook them up with different ambassadors, especially when we're in D.C., to create connections between the counties. But I would say there's a lot of counties focused on the two sides of the coin. One is foreign direct investment and getting foreign money to flow into the country for economic development. And we have a lot of counties who are doing export focused. But there are some counties like Fairfax County, Virginia, that actually has trade offices around the world. And being in the Tyson's Corner area and technology and a lot of defense, it makes sense. But it's a huge focus, and we could have a whole other panel discussion around community and economic development, I'm sure. Well, that's a great place to kind of wrap up. Um, Let's do a sister county in Ireland, too. That's great. Thank <laughs> you. I'm going to turn this back over to Mo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's forum, and uh, hopefully you feel a little better about paying your property taxes. <laughs> Always know that CMC programs are available through a number of venues, including Columbus Television uh, on WOSU and PBS affiliates throughout the state of Ohio, as well as through the CMC website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors in Morp City and the Dispatch Media Group. And finally, to this panel of speakers, John O'Grady, Matthew Chase, Cindy Bobbitt, and Barbara Carmen. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. <laughs>